do you mind taking us for a walk down memory lane and, and filling us in from where you started out to where you're at today? Well, that'd be a long, that'd be a long <laughs> show. Well, well, we'll just ask for the highlights then. So I'll tell yeah, you what. Okay. Well, what I'll do is I'll, I'll go down, I'll skip down memory lane, but I'll, I'll skip all the bad neighborhoods. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so actually, anyway, I, I began I began a long time ago, but I did not receive a recording contract until I left New York and moved to Los Angeles in 1978. And then I spent a couple of years preparing demos and so on and so forth until um, my partners and I recorded like most of what turned out to be the first album. We didn't get a deal right away. Uh -huh. Um I went back to New York and I kind of was done. I'd been doing it for so long that I didn't think if this didn't happen, nothing would. So you were but a couple despondent. Of back, well, yeah, I mean, in some ways it was even a relief because I'd been working so hard for so long that I just felt like I had recorded something that I really, really liked. And if that didn't work, then what was the point, you know? Yeah. yeah I so anyway, um, back in New York, a couple of months later, quite by a coincidence, someone played a cassette for someone at Electra Records, a label that had already passed on me. And, um, and this guy fell in love with it and got me signed. And so those first hits and first couple of albums were all on Electra Records. Then things changed, music changed, times changed in the 80s, and it was a slow thing for me until um, I met a guy who became my manager for a long time, and he convinced me that I should try to work on the places overseas where I'd been popular. Uh -huh. So we started getting um, record deals in Japan and in France and in England. And uh, that's how I sustained my career, building an independent label for my, right. you know, it wasn't really a label, but it was a production company. Right. And we made a number of records in those countries and traveled them. And, um, and that still goes on today. Um, well, the road hasn't been too bad then at all. No, it hasn't been too bad. What it is, is you have to get hip to the fact that nothing stays up forever. You have to realize that if you really love doing it, you'll continue finding a way to do it. The, the, the big rarefied air, the days of the Grammys and big hit records and stuff, that was over a long time ago for me. But I felt like in some ways I was just getting started in finding a voice, you know, in um, recording new songs. And and so I have, I've done probably since then, another um, eight or nine albums, maybe 10. Mm -hmm. And in, as of late, more like putting out singles because who listens That's to albums? Fashion. Yeah, absolutely. So, so yeah, so the changes in the business have made it even a little bit harder than it was. But um, before COVID, I had a couple of new singles out and uh, they were critically appreciated. Uh -huh. It's just hard, you know, to get to Australia and so on anymore, because uh, if there's no support, then, you know, it, in other words, if you're not making big hit records where everybody knows about it all over the world, then you become sort of a boutique record maker uh -huh. and people have to be following you on your website and on Spotify and all of that. So, yeah. So like so many of us who um, had success of that level, time changes and you have to dig whether you're really in it for the music or if you're dreaming about uh, the dream that will never come true again. You know, that right. was that. Well, talking about that level of success, of course, everybody right around the world knows you from that major hit that you had in 1980, Steal Away. What were you writing about there? Nothing. That was <laughs> not, you know, those, those, most of those songs were 
craft. They weren't really coming from inside of me in any way. But what I found out later on was that the songs took a strong meaning for other people. And over these years, people have come up to me on shows all around the world telling me stories about how this song, they got married and this was their song or they fell in love with, you know, so many of those kind of songs. And I realized that maybe I didn't start out with a particular feeling about it, but it developed into what the audience made it into. So you were just writing, you were just crafting a hit. I was just crafting songs. That first album, most of it was made in a small studio that had, this was in, we started in 78 and we piecemealed it. But the only two clients this little home studio had were me and Prince. And um, Prince was kind of just getting in there and just starting to make, you know, um, a couple of hits, but he was still not exploding yet, you know? Uh, uh, and so he worked all night and we worked in the day. And um, and so there was a lot of craft involved in it, you know, just the idea of writing songs and trying to find a way to get a deal. That was really the the ambition. And And later, you know, as time goes on, if you stick around in this game, you don't write those kind of songs anymore. The songs become more introspective, you know, more, more um, about the world that we live in, Correct. you know. More about your own deeper, life experiences. You know you don't, yeah, and you know you don't have to play it for a record company and you don't have to get approval on it, you know. So you can do what you want. So, As you, somebody who's in broadcasting, you might dig the, the latest of the singles. It's called Audio Graffiti. I'd when love you, to hear um, that. We'll, we'll you, definitely have a listen. Yeah, that's a, that's a fun one. Tell me a little bit about that one then. Well, you know, the, the, the conversation for years and years now has been about <coughs> the changes mm -hmm. in the business, you know, and, and how, um, you know, how people aren't making music in studios anymore. They're working in their living rooms and all of that. So this was really a song that talked about, you know, it's a, it's a four minute song, but it, it references that conversation about, you know, the opening line is we've come a long way since the Fillmore days and now we're all living in the digital age. And it just goes on to talk about the different levels, you know, um, the queen of soul has gone away and hard time has fallen on the radio waves, you know, yeah. so those are the kind of, uh, images about the the dialogue that goes on with all musicians yeah you've certainly seen a lot of changes in your time haven't you yeah because i started you know all the way back in the late 60s and my first real band was with nile rogers we were both kids and um he lived in the bronx and i lived in brooklyn and um we met in new york city on an audition for something else and had a band and that was really when I got inspired you know like that was the first real band that played real gigs and it was thrilling you know so in that time you can't even measure the changes not only in the music but the way they make the music and the delivery system of the music you know where are their record stores I don't know about Australia but you can't find one here no we don't we don't have them either um we follow closely on the heels of the states and we're we're with the same technology as everybody else which is just crazy so the the whole you describe it as a thrill i mean there was a thrill in making music there was a thrill in buying records there was a thrill in seeing live um artists play has that thrill disappeared it hasn't disappeared but um it's been somewhat eroded over the years by you know just the time and all of the, like those changes that we talk about so i still get inspired to write songs and i still get inspired to do shows but it's like it's harder to keep a dream alive when you've been doing it for 50 years you know 
I guess that's understandable, isn't it? I mean, you've you've realized yeah. the dream. So where do you go now? You just, I guess now well, it's more of a hobby. Yeah, the, then it's the thrill of playing with the guys that you, guys and girls that you play with and you really love the band and that's fun. And, you know, you find enjoyment and aspects of it for sure. But when you're young like that, it's um, it's a whole different kind of a ride. You know, you're coming from a little neighborhood in Brooklyn where none of those things seem possible. And all of a sudden you're in playing shows in Greenwich Village when, you know, the film Maurice and Jimi Hendrix and all of these people are all in the, in the air as it were. And, um, and I think it was just more of an excitement on, on the street about music, you know, people felt it and, um, musicians had a lot more, I hate to say this, but there was a lot more integrity in being a musician. There wasn't well, all of the, I mean, the, there used to be a, a phrase about, you know, selling out in the music business, like don't sell out. But now the object is to sell out. What does you know, that mean? Wind up with it. You know what I mean? The object is to get popular so that you can have a, 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 a sneaker deal and a fashion right. line and right. so on, you know, and, and to it's... do commercials for toilet paper and whatever else, you know. Yeah. So that that's become the objective rather than making as 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 best music as you possibly can, the, the highest form of music. Yeah. And... I mean, I hate to I, I hate to minimize it because there are a lot of good things out there still, but the things that are on the enormous level, you know, the top twenty all the time. Those are, it's a whole different show business scene now, you know. It's not like all of the years that I was coming up. Gotcha. All of the years I was coming up, it was quite different in, in a more organic way. You know what I mean? Yeah, Just I, everything I, is more. I absolutely do. And I think one person's... Uh, one person's creativity lifted another person's creativity and you're all pitting yourselves against each other and trying to get better and better and better. We don't see that today anymore. And I guess that's why no. everyone talks about the good old days and, and that music's never been the same since then. Well, that's the reason for the song Audio Graffiti because it does address that, it does address that, you know, dilemma that we're in about it and i don't think that you know there's nothing good anymore i mean i just heard a beautiful record by brandy carlisle there's a lot of i don't know if she's yeah, yeah. popular down there yeah. but you know she you know there's there is good stuff that's still organic and still happening but it's just not the it's not the mainstream anymore you know that's, that's what that's what it is so people talk about it People miss the old days. They reminisce about the clubs they used to go to wherever you live, wherever you are. There were those clubs and the late nights and the party and the whole thing. It is that even that's different, you know, even that's changed. And I see it here in, in Woodstock, New York, where I live. It used to be. Well, you were the epitome of the, the hippie era and the party era and the creative era. Right. And, and it used to be a place that you came to to have your dream come true. And now it's a place that you've already had to have your dream come true to come here. It's very expensive and hard to find places to live. And, you know, it took the same trip that places take now. You know, it's crazy. Houses are selling for a fortune and there are bidding wars. So if you buy a house for $800,000, you might have to spend... 400,000 more to keep up with the bidding. So who's going to come here anymore? Not not struggling artists, that's for sure. Yeah, you, you don't paint a very happy picture, really, do you? Do you think it'll ever come back? I guess probably not in our lifetimes. Well, it's not an unhappy picture. It's a real, it's the reality of what's going on. You know, if that's unhappy, some people are probably having the time of their life and whatever it is. I'm just saying the difference between that and what we're remembering yeah. is Fast. completely the opposite. Yeah. You know, it isn't like that anymore. Yeah. So 
I hope I hope that people um, that are coming up get the chance to feel those same experiences on some level. Like in Woodstock, all there's one music club left, wow. and there used to be five or six. So wow. certainly, they're not going to have the same experience, you know. Wow, it's very sad. Do you think? Do you think? I mean, as as most things in life are cyclical, and 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 a lot of what's old is new again. I wonder if we'll see a resurgence of that raw, naive, kind of organic, as you say, way of making music and the thrill. I mean, it's all very convoluted now, and business deals and technology mixed and I wonder whether it'll all just come back to its roots. I hope so. I think in pockets, you know, I think you'll find places that, you know, don't forget that the industry was a very cutthroat, ruthless, you know, industry back when, but these communities like Macon, Georgia, the Bay Area and San Francisco, Woodstock, you know, there were certain places that developed their own musical culture. And then, you know, Bob Dylan and the band here, they got brought into the mainstream, but they weren't the mainstream that was going on at that time yeah. by a long shot. Yeah. And so I think I think that could happen. I know that uh, there's a place um, in uh, North Carolina called uh, Asheville, which is a place that's developed a big music community. And I don't know the politics on the ground there, but, you know, a lot of things are going on there. So, yeah, I, I think, It'll look, start to last year again. was the first, yeah, last year was the first year that vinyl outsold CDs. Amazing, isn't it? That's so, right. What does that mean, you know? Yeah, that's right. So, so with, with a bit of luck, there's, hope for young artists to, to experience the same as what you guys did. What do you think of, of, the, of the fact that you're considered one of the fathers of the yacht rock sound? Oh, I think it's fun. You know, I mean, the whole yacht rock thing is fun. And um, it's given it's given a whole new audience a turn on to the music. Like they aren't what you think. When you go to a concert for Yacht Rock Review, which is completely separate from what I do. But when I do a Yacht Rock show, the audience is like from 25 to 35 oh, is that right? years old. Wow. And yeah, there's no, there's no older people there. It's not that kind of a show. And, and um, so it's fun because here you are playing for a whole other generation. And I mean, thousands of people come to these shows you know, the Atlanta show that I played right before COVID had, I think, uh, 6,500 people. All young ones. Amazing. You yeah. know, just amazing. And so, you know, for some reason, they searched out that kind of music. That's encouraging. And, you know, I don't even know. Yeah, I don't know how it happened, but I mean, that's, <laughs> they know. And, and by the way, Sandy, you can look out into the audience and see every single young person mouthing the words to every song. They do, they know it all. And I mean, that's in New York City and Chicago and Los Angeles and Atlanta. It's big. It's a big thing, you know. So I think we're just lucky to um, have been rediscovered, if you will, you know. Yeah. That's how and, I and brought to brought in front of all the young people. That's awesome. So I'm I'm very encouraged to hear that they're right up with all of the music. That's great. So what's next yeah. for you? What's next for you, Robbie? Uh, once COVID passes us by, I know it's starting to open up there a little bit now. But I guess your ambition would still be to to travel to the yeah, places I, where you're big. Yeah, I have um, I have some shows booked. I was very cautious about accepting too much work because the last time we lost it all yeah you know with cancellations and so on so um i've got a few gigs in the fall and um a very big yacht rock gig in in uh, in jamaica oh nice. uh, in february which is a nice getaway Absolutely. but i've been just cautious back and seeing what's going to happen with this you know 
Yeah. And that's that's next. You know, I have a few things on the on the um, on the plate songs to record and um, and still a dream to come someday and play in Australia. You know, but I'd love never, to see you here. I've never been, you know, approached. So um, um, but if I if I was, I would, you know, I'd love oh, to cool. do that. I'll spread the word. Yeah, yeah, please. <laughs> Finally, Robbie, can you, I know it's a big ask, but if you had to choose your all-time favourite song that you've uh, that you've made, which which song would you choose? One of mine? Oh, boy. Yeah. Um, I don't want to know about someone else's. Well, I mean, I've recorded like all kinds of music. Yeah. Um, let's see. I think... my favorite song maybe i change the recorded. question what about if not your favorite because that's pretty tough is there one that's closest to your heart that means the most to you that that uh that came from a place within you that that really resonated with with people that you were bursting to put out one that one that really stands out above the rest for you well it wasn't a very popular song, but there's one particular song that that's that stands out like that for me, from coming from a very real place, and it's called "Walls Come Down," and it's from the um, "Walking on Water" album, and that was a very uh, heartfelt and deep song um, that happened at that time in my life, and it's, uh, I mean, there there were a lot of on, a lot of songs on that album. Goodbye to LA. There were a lot. It was a very, uh, it was a very deep song at the beginning of another phase of my life and career. That's you know, obviously when you I were think, coming back to New York. Well, I was back to New York, but it was when I was um, getting divorced, getting um, record deals. Um, overseas it was a begin it was a restart of everything you know like after losing my deal on the major label then recreating the career again starting in around 88 um and so i was kind of in a good place after coming out of a hard place you know and so that was that's i think what it was for me and and i really enjoyed that whole album but walls come down is probably the the most significant piece that and that pertains to the fact that your own personal walls came down i think it was more of a of a metaphor for like the end of a relationship right. you know the, the, the chorus went when you hear that sound and it keeps you up all night when the walls come down around you and the wind blows through your life robbie dupre thank you so much for chatting with us today. It's been such a pleasure. It was my pleasure.